Welcome back. So, today we are picking up on that same shopping trip at Bedford Antiques that I did last week. And last week I showed you the haul from one particular booth. So now we're going to get a chance to look at all the rest of it. All right, when we come back. Well, the first thing I saw when I walked in the front door was a setup, uh, and I've shown you this before. They have an area in the front near the register where they will do Halloween or Christmas displays or, you know, fall with the hay wagons, whatever. And it was vintage sewing machines this time. And I saw a sewing machine. Well, I'm not getting the sewing machine because we couldn't seem to figure out if it was working. Uh, but I thought you might like taking a look at it all the same because heaven knows I did. So here is uh, a vintage sewing machine. <laughs> so I found something that I am personally interested in. Let's take a look at this. This is a gorgeous old Singer machine. And look at the condition. Look at that chrome. I mean, it's beautiful. Okay, the price is $325. The problem is that it's not really working. So what I'm doing with this is I have the owner right here. And if we can figure out how to get this thing to work, well, this is just going to be my birthday present to me. I know it's early, but still. So, I've got my fingers crossed because this is a gorgeous piece and this is the kind of sewing machine I like. They are simple, they don't do anything super fancy, and it's the sort of machine I grew up learning on. So, we're going to see. But, look at that. So tell me that's not worth $325. Alright, well, I'll have to keep you posted on this. Now that's the kind of sewing machine I grew up on. Um, when I was a kid, my mother was not a sewer. So when I wanted to sit down at a sewing machine, it would be my grandmother's sewing machine. So the machines that I was using in the late 50s, early 60s, when I was learning to sew, were a good 20, 30 years old at that time. They weren't, you know, the the, the models that were coming out in that era. Uh, it was a long time before, I think it was the late 60s, before I actually got like a new sewing machine. And I have to say, I like the old ones better. It's just me, but I really do. So if we can figure out what's wrong with that old machine, and it's still available for sale, I may go back for it. Um, next up, I went over to the corner booth, and uh, we go in there. That's usually the first thing I see because I'm heading toward the second floor. So I go in the door, I turn right, and there is that booth, and it's a large booth, all kinds of stuff. And this time I found something quite interesting and I thought I would share it with you. Oh, by the way, it did come home with me. What we have here is a pair of occupied Japan figurines. And let me just turn these around. They have little backpacks which presumably hold toothpicks or something of the sort. Um, male and female, uh, we're looking at, okay, $12 for the pair, $6 each. And um, it's a little higher than I ordinarily pay 
for occupied Japan pieces. Not that they're not worth it. Um, there's a lot of nice luster wear on the finish on this one. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take them because at $6 a piece, and these are good sized, about five inches, I think I will not have any difficulty finding a buyer for them. Those Occupied Japan figurines are, are great. Um, and one of them, the figurine of the lady, has a wonderful luster wear finish. It's very hard, and this is one of the things I've noticed. You see luster wear in person, and you see it in a still photo or on video, and it's hard to capture the iridescence of luster wear. It's beautiful. It's the sort of thing you can spot from across the room. So uh, those pieces are very nice. Occupied Japan, um, decent size. Uh, I am not concerned about my ability to sell pieces like that because there is a strong market for Occupied Japan. And there is a strong market for Japanese luster wear uh, there is a strong market for Asian art pieces like that, figurines, and believe it or not, a strong market for little toothpick holders. So, uh, the toothpick holders is the only part that really surprises me. I just don't understand why toothpick holders are and have always been such a thing. I get it from times past. But I have a feeling if my dentist thought for one instant I was cramming little bits of wood into my mouth, he'd probably have something to say about it. Nevertheless, people do collect toothpick holders. So I went around, and of course I saw Janine's booth on my way upstairs. We already saw that video. But then I stopped at the foot of the stairs and took a look at some things in the booths there. So let's take a look at what I saw heading up to the second floor. Well, this is a piece that is not coming home with us. Uh, Japan piece, uh, Yukago, that was the importer. We've got a beautiful little Capodimonte style flower here. And guess what this is? Yes, indeed, those little um, rests in the corner are for your cigarettes. This is an ashtray. Can you imagine anybody stamping out their butts in something this pretty? I know, but they did it all the time. So, it stays, unfortunately, and we are off on the hunt again. Now, Yukago is, that's the company I mentioned, that is one of those American-based companies that imported Japanese goods in the mid-century. Um, and I think I've mentioned, I, I, I imagine I've got about 30 names on my ongoing list of Japanese import companies from the mid-century. And this was a thing. These things were everywhere. That little Capodimonte style ashtray with the little um, uh, three-dimensional flowers. I, I, it's beyond me why somebody would say, oh yeah, I'm going to put my cigarette out in this. But they did. That was a thing. You went into a house and they would have all kinds of fussy, frilly little Capodimonte dishes or figurines or lamps. I mean, some of this stuff is just astounding. And they would want a little ashtray to go along with it. And they would want that ashtray to be pretty and highly decorative. And there it was. And I just wonder if people could really bring themselves to just stub a cigarette out in it. But pieces like that are great. You take a piece like that and, you know, it's a trinket dish today. 
um, certainly that's more appropriate for throwing your change or your jewelry in, in any case. Nice piece. I don't think I mentioned the price on that when I was filming the video. It was $10. That put it a little high for that sort of piece. But who knows? The dealer could run a discount on the booth. I could change my mind later. I know where it is. But when I put that piece back, I looked at the shelves below. And I saw something really nice. So let's take a look. Same booth, by the way. All right, same booth as that little Yukago ashtray, which you see right over here in the background. We have a figural lamp. Uh, two Chinese people. Um, I'm not sure if they're boys or girls, or both. Whatever. Uh, very, very nice piece. Um, we're probably looking at the lamp base itself at about 12 inches. And then, of course, we've got the socket on top. Um, this is definitely a Japan-made piece. It's not marked, but I'm very sure of what this is. $25.00. Nice figural lamp. I am going to put it back, but I am also going to think about it because lamps like this sell for more than $25. And even though I prefer not to traffic in very expensive items on my Etsy shop, you know, it doesn't hurt to have a few highly collectible even if they are pricey items, because not everybody is looking for something in the $10 to $20 range. Occasionally, people are looking for more expensive items, and this is a real beauty. Now, that lamp, boy, you can see the super glossy finish on that not lusterware. Um, this uh, lusterware has a metal in the glaze, which produces that highly lustrous and iridescent finish. This seems to have been just a super shiny top coat. Um, nice Japanese piece of a pair of Chinese children. Interestingly enough, that was a very common theme in Japanese decorative arts of the mid-century. They really didn't do much in the way of little Japanese children, but little Chinese children, Chinese women, etc., all over the place. Not sure what that was all about, but boy, you know, it's there and you can spot it. That lamp at $25 was not, in my opinion, overpriced. Not by a long shot. Um, the cord was old. The lamp would need to be rewired. So if I were to buy a piece like that, um, I would have to build in a, a certain amount of extra investment to cover the new wiring. Uh, I would not sell a piece like that. Um, I saw the plug, it was one of those round plugs, and I hate to say it, but I don't trust them. They're not polarized. I, it's the sort of thing that I would prefer to rewire. So, for me, no. But if I wanted a piece like that for myself and not for resale, that was a very nice price. And I can certainly see that with a nice little fiberglass shade, very, very 1950s. So I thought that was terrific. And it was a piece that I just wanted to share with you because I did, in fact, get a 1950s lamp on this shopping trip. But we'll come to that later. Um, I made it up to the second floor. Uh, somebody over here is going to end up in my lap in a second or two. I know it's coming. 
I made it up to the second floor, and the first thing I saw was a set of salt and pepper shakers that were just Christmas and steampunk and just, oh, you name it. So let's take a look. Well, second floor, and let me just step over to show you the staircase so you can see I didn't get very far. And already, snowman salt and pepper shakers, unmarked. Um, and there are two markets for this salt and pepper sh uh, shaker set. One is the Christmas market. The other is the steampunk market because these old top hats are just such a steampunk item. Two fifty. Oh yeah, they're coming home with me. But before we walk away, I know some of you like these little hens in baskets. Each one is $10, and I expect the green one is fairly rare. It's not coming home with us because I don't deal specifically in this sort of thing, and this is a specialized market. But, nonetheless, if any of you are in the area, not a bad price. So, $2.50, yeah. That's the sort of piece that I'm probably going to set aside and, and hold for six or eight months and then list in my Etsy shop closer to Christmas. Uh, the top hat, that is just a huge steampunk motif. And the whole Christmassy thing, I think this is something that is probably going to sell more easily in November or December than it would right now, February, March. Nevertheless, I thought they were really nice pieces and I was glad to get them for the price. So after this, I went into, uh, no, I'm sorry, take that back. While I was still in that area, uh, I did that quick film uh, with the little hens in nests, because that is a thing. Some people collect them. It's nothing that really appeals to me, but glassware collectors actually, you know, find that quite collectible. So I did want to show that they are out there. They are available at reasonable prices in a variety of colors. I think one was milk glass and two were colored glass. One was green and one was amber, I think. Um, they're out there in variety and at good prices. So throwing that out for all of you glassware collectors to take a look at. Next, I went in to a booth that I do not ordinarily spend a great deal of time in. And this is because I've got in there, I've looked at their things. Um, a lot of it just seems overpriced to me. Um, most of it is not really old. It's vintage in that sort of 25 year old vintage thing. Um, you know, the 1980s, 1990s, that vintage era, not vintage going back into the 40s, 50s, whatever. No. Um, there's not a lot that really appeals to me in that booth, but I decided to check it out anyway. So, lesson learned, whenever you see a booth, look in. You never know what you're going to find. And this was a booth that I had become accustomed to thinking of as, and I'll walk right past you because you don't have anything for me. Well, surprise, surprise. So let's take a look. Now, this is a booth that I usually just pass by. Um, I find that nothing is exceptionally old, nothing is exceptionally interesting, but I did see a couple of interesting things today. Now, the seller does him or herself no favor 
with these ribbons because they obscure the piece. This is a mid-century Scotty Dog ashtray. Um, and it is a Japanese piece. The seller is saying it's Art Deco era. era. No, it is not. It is mid-century. How can we tell? That's how we can tell. Um, nice piece. At $18, it is a little too much for me. Thank you. But let's slide over here and take a look at another piece. This is $20. This is from the same era, and this is one of those planter lamps that were so popular in the 60s, uh, 50s and 60s, you know, when people had television sets. And this was a huge thing in that era. Outdoor barbecues and people having their own little fire pits and just that was a thing. And this is a beautifully executed piece. The shade is all wrong for it, but $20, not bad. It's not a great price, not by a long shot, and it's not a good enough deal to lure me into picking it up because, frankly, I would have to redo the shade or just get a completely different shade. I don't know which. Nice mid-century sort of image, even though it's not classically what we think of as mid-century. This is mid-century because it's capturing that whole outdoor barbecue thing that became popular in the 50s and 60s. So, lesson, oh, 25% off. I have to read. At $15, that lamp is coming home with me. Okay, easy call. 25% off did it. But it goes to show that just because a booth may have left you coming up dry again, 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 doesn't mean you shouldn't stick your nose in every once in a while. Lamp coming home, $15, it's worth it to me to change the shade or maybe even make a project out of recovering this one. So that was the mid-century lamp that came home with me. Um, it was a bit of a chance, but it was only $15. Bit of a chance because that is a very sort of specific design. That is going to resonate with people who did backyard barbecuing when they were kids in the 50s and 60s. Um, that's, that's the market. Uh, these lamps, and I should probably take the opportunity to talk about these, these porcelain lamps, um, Japanese mostly. They were all television lamps. When televisions first came into the American household, they came in as pieces of furniture, just as the radios had done before. Radios had been large console boxes, and it was like a bookcase with no books, but it came in as a piece of furniture. In the 50s and 60s, it wasn't just televisions. Your stereo came in as a piece of furniture. The big old hi-fi console, they had combinations of televisions and stereos, hi-fi. I'm not sure they were stereos. They were hi-fis for sure. And your, your record player, your television would have been all this, this one giant entertainment center. Although, frankly, we didn't use the term entertainment center at that time. And when we did start using the term entertainment center, we were talking about a bookcase or an armoire or something that you would shove your entertainment pieces in. When this, okay, we're back. 
when the televisions, stereos, radios, when they all first made their appearance, we didn't have a template for what they were. And so the template we applied to them was furniture. It was cabinetry. It was console. It was sideboard. They looked like consoles or cabinets or sideboards. And we used them in the same way. So interestingly enough, even when televisions changed and they, they were no longer huge, you know, like pieces in wood grain cabinets, and they started to look a little more like TVs, even the more portable televisions, still shove those planters on top of them. Um, I, I, my mother had a portable television, it was probably a, like a two foot by two foot by two foot cube. And, but that was considered portable. It certainly didn't have any wood grain on it. It was all like plastic and metal with knobs and dials. My mother had a doily on top of it and a set of like little figurines sitting on top. I look back on that and think, was she out of her mind? I, that was just such a ridiculous thing to do. And in between the little figurines was the little rabbit ears antenna, you know, as if it were a work of art. Uh, yeah, that's what we did. And we treated these, uh, these new electronic devices um, as if they were uh, knickknack shelves. And we had whole bunches of special knickknacks. They were, they were designed to go on top. And that little lamp from that little shop was one such piece that would have gone on top of the television set. Um, maybe you would have put a plant in it. I don't know. The plant openings are very small. Personally, I would have thought, you know, it would have been more appropriate for a bedroom and you shove your watch or your change or whatever in those little compartments. But hey, no, that's not what they did with it. They stuck it on top of the TV and they were TV lamps. And the ones that we're the most familiar with are the long sleek panthers and whatever. But they all had the same general look. They were long. They often held plants so that you could further disguise the technology and pretend it was something. I don't know what they were pretending it was. This is my garden sunroom. I don't know. You stick a plant in there and they had their little fiberglass shades and, you know, that was the thing. And I know we can look at it and laugh. Heaven knows I do. I make fun of them shamelessly because it was my childhood. It's what I grew up with. And what I didn't see in my own home, I saw in my friends' homes. And this stuff was just, it was ubiquitous. I look back on that now and think to myself, who were we kidding? This was not a sideboard or a console, why were we pretending and we were? So I grabbed that lamp because at 25% off, $15, I can afford to take a chance on it. And I think I would like to do something about creating a shade for that lamp. I think that would be a nice project piece to tackle, to try to figure out what would be the right kind of shade for a lamp like that. Not necessarily the kind of shade it may have originally had, but what would be good for it? What would really work well and carry that 50s look, you know, into the whole piece because that green gingham pattern shade was all wrong. So that was absolutely coming with me project piece probably will not show up in my shop for a while, but we're going to do something with that. And then, of course, remember that little Scotty ashtray. So, 
Okay, 25% off. So at $13.50, I still consider this Scotty dog to be a little on the high price side, but he is coming home with me because there are just too many markets for this piece. Scotty dog collectors are just a huge market. We've discussed that before. People who have these little dogs like having the stuff wrapped around these little dogs in their homes, and they just collect it like crazy. They wear Scotty jewelry. I have a friend like that. They wear Scotty jewelry. They, they drink their coffee from Scotty mugs. It's such a big deal. And because this is a really nice mid-century piece, it has that market too. Yes, at $13.50, suddenly that $18 Scotty ashtray became a much more attractive buy. It's a very, very nice piece. Um, Japanese import, no, not Art Deco, mid-century. But we've talked about this before. A lot of people make that mistake because there were a great many elements that were present in Art Deco design that were also present in mid-century design. But in this case, no, they're off by about 20, 25 years. That is a piece that would have come out in the 50s or 60s. But as I say, at $13.50, absolutely much more attractive price. And while I am on the subject of the Scotty dog, did you notice that little ribbon? Now that was that sort of thin, papery ribbon. Um, oh, I, you see it coming out at Christmas time a lot. It's just, um, it's not cloth ribbon. It's tied around the dog's neck and it was tied on other items in that shop. I've got to tell you, I think that is a mistake because when you go into an antique booth and you're scanning around, just visually scanning. You don't want things like the price tag, and that's what this ribbon was holding. You don't want the price tag to distract your eye from the piece or to, to muddy your vision. You want people to be able to see the piece itself and not get distracted by something that, that is of no interest to them. So for those of you who are doing uh, brick and mortar antique booths, keep that in mind. It's not something your customers are going to appreciate. I was having difficulty just getting that ribbon out of the way so that I could see the piece. I just don't think that's a very good idea at all. Remember, you want your item to be what people see. You certainly don't need your price tag to be what they see first. You know, you want to sell them on the item and then they're going to look at the price tag and say, okay, you know, you don't want, you don't want to do that the other way around because people are more likely to buy when they've made that little emotional investment in the piece. All right. So that is what we have today. Uh, and we have much more from this trip, which is good because it looks like we may be snowed in for the next couple of days here. So no shopping for me, at least until they clear the roads out a little. All right. I hope you are all doing well. Those of you who are in the path of the snowstorm, you know, stay warm, stay safe. You know, this too shall pass. And in the meantime, let's take a look at JLS's wonderful Horizon pictures. And I will see you all tomorrow.